Pacific Science Society. So um, the Tropical Butterfly House at Pacific Science Center. Um, just to give you an idea of perspective, Pacific Science Center's this whole area, and the Tropical Butterfly House is one part of it. It's this corner over here. It's um, got a glass roof and glass walls on the west, I mean, I'm sorry, the east and the south side to let in as much light as possible. Light is sort of an ongoing motif for us, trying to get enough light and um, create a place that's welcoming to tropical butterflies and that feels tropical to people. Um, we're just trying to capture every, every photon we can. Um, Pacific Science Center is an independent, not-for-profit that is dedicated to introducing the public and inspiring people to, with um, science, math, and technology. And that's just a picture of us being funded by donations. Um, Pacific Science Center is a campus that includes two IMAX theaters. It's um, <laughs> got 15,000 feet of math and science exhibits. There's a laser light theater that you can go to. Many, many people went there when they were young, but it's still fun. Um, planetarium, there's science on a sphere, which if you have not been to Pacific Science Center in the last two years, come back and see science on a sphere. It's a big white sphere, and then there's eight projectors that you have computer programs that will turn the sphere into Earth, and you can see where CO2 emissions are coming from and where they're being blown with the all this force, or it could become Jupiter, and you can see the big red spot on Jupiter and how it changes over time. It can be anything spherical that we have a data set for, so definitely worth seeing. We also have a butterfly house, which I'm going to talk about, a 4,000 square foot um, year-round free-flying exhibit for butterflies. It um, enters and exits into the building's interior, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And it hosts over 600,000 guests per year. Um, flying about 25,000 butterflies each year. So um, the butterflies are seriously outnumbered by people in there, although at any one time you don't know it. Um, but it's absolutely true that if everybody touched one butterfly, we'd have nothing left. Um, and if everybody picked one plant or one flower, there'd be no nectar. So um, we, we are very busy, and it does occasionally take a toll, a toll on us. But the butterflies that we have generally, no, would you please sit down? They generally have uh, fairly short lives, um, not because of human predation, but because we have species that live um, for anywhere from two weeks to two or three months. The longest I've seen a butterfly live in there is about four months. Um, we had a uh, shipment of butterflies from the Philippines, and then there was a good deal of trouble with that vendor where they were unable to send us shipments. And I kept seeing this one butterfly that could only have come from there. And I would see it week in and week out, never looking any different. So that's, that, that was kind of the one that we kept track of. Um, what was it? It was an uh, idea of It was a, a paper kite. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, at the end of its life, it looked exactly the same as it did. It, it had no tattering, no wing damage. Um, I got really fond of that one. So. Yeah. Um, the Tropical Butterfly House was built in 1998. I had very little experience with butterflies at that time. It just was like, yeah, we can do it. We'll find out. We'll learn as we go. It's um, and, and it has been great. I have learned a lot. There's lots I would still like to know. Um, but one of the things we saw as a sort of submission was to bring a little light and warmth to Seattle. Um, people come to the Butterfly House who really don't even want to see butterflies. They just come there because it's the middle of winter and they're depressed and they feel better when they leave. So uh, we can do a little bit of a community service that way as well. I'm going to give you a start with a tour of what you would see if you came to Pacific Science Center's Butterfly House as a guest. Um, you're going to come in here and a friendly person will welcome you in. They'll talk to you about how to behave, tell you that we don't touch butterflies, and that's important to know because some places do allow people to touch butterflies. So we make sure that folks know that rule. 
and that includes not stepping on them, which <laughs> should be very obvious, but people don't know the butterflies puddle, that they sit on the floor to drink, or that they rest on the floor to collect energy before they fly. So you go to get a great picture, and you step back, and you step back again, and your kid screams, and you don't know why, and then, whoops, it's too late. So um, we, we talk to people about that. As people leave, they're checked again for butterflies to make sure nothing landed on them. Um, we don't want to introduce our butterflies into Washington State. They, they have a mission inside that exhibit, but they don't have any place out in our environment. Um, people come to the butterfly house, they bring what they already, who they are, and what their experience is going to be. Some people come to visit with their families, and we see a lot of folks talking to each other, a lot of um, interaction, sometimes from people who really weren't that relaxed when they came in, and they start unwinding a little bit. Um, some people come to re learn by reading signs, and we don't actually see that's a lot. People don't really read the signs in the butterfly house <laughs> as much as we want. Um, but I think that's because they're learning in other ways. Um, and what, what I hope is that they become inspired and go find out later. Um, they might get a chance to chat with an interpretive staff member. And after I put this in, I noticed our interpretive staff member is holding a butterfly. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> It's actually a dead butterfly, and, and at one point we experimented with using the wings for butterflies that had died and letting people touch them to see how fragile they were. Um, it was great for the, the, that person, the person having an experience, but everybody there else there, you can't tell by looking from as far away as you are if it's alive or dead. They just thought, what a great idea, I'm going to pet one too. So we have to pull that. And what we do now is we have an activity called a carton activity outside the butterfly house where we'll prepare, when the butterflies die, we'll prepare their wings so that people can handle them in a very controlled setting and be really clear that you don't just go grab butterflies and pat them and let them go again. Um, and our exhibit. Some people visit just for enjoyment. A lot of photographers um, come through or just a place to go. This is a picture of what you see out the window of the butterfly house. And um, <laughs> there's just some days when it's just great to be in there and it doesn't really matter why. We've had people come in with a lot of specific agendas. Um, something I feel strongly about is this pre-literacy skills that you see a child and they have a picture guide and they're kind of pointing to a picture and they're pointing at something and they're putting together that, hey, we have a literature for a reason. We have written materials to enjoy, to learn, to, to correlate. And um, she's pointing at a butterfly that's out of the picture. Um, just like that, yes. Um, but she's putting things together in her, in her head and using the materials around her to do that. We have uh, people who study the wings of some of the iridescent butterfly species to find out why these colorless scales are, are throwing color back at them. Um, and high-speed photography, just capturing butterflies mid-flight with their wings uh, frozen in time. Little kids love the butterflies. Um, when we opened, everybody said, oh, my little girl's going to love it. My daughter's going to be there. But what we found is bigger kids and, and boys like it too. And these guys did not expect to be getting their picture taken slack jaw looking at butterflies. It was the last thing. These are three uh, volunteers that we trained that really came in for some of our, our space themed programming. And they just ended up deciding butterflies. Um, some species, people come in and they see some of the species that drink fruit juices and when we get a chance we point out that a lot of them have eye spots on them, a lot of them have browns and grays, they have sort of mottled colors. Do you have any idea of what might be going on with that? If, it, if you were in a darker environment, what do you think you would see? Um, maybe just the eyes. You know. 
the darkness. Do you think you'd want to eat something with eyes that big? Maybe not. <laughs> um, other butterflies like nectar or pollen, and you can learn a lot by observing. Um, sometimes we'll see butterflies that appear to be eating pollen that we go look it up and it, there's no reference to them eating pollen. So I'm not, we're not always sure what's going on with that. Um, maybe there's nectar mixed in. You can learn about the life cycle, and one of the things, when I'll, I'll show it in a minute, but we have a window where you can watch the butterflies emerge from the chrysalis. If you want to see that, come in first thing in the morning when we open the tent. Most of the activities, most of it's already over by then, but some is still going on between 10 and 11, and if you come in the afternoon, you're just going to get a pretty, pretty much some leftovers from that. Um, find out how species are named. We we'll learn about mimicry. This, um, there, there's many tiger mimic butterflies in, in the butterfly house, and a lot of times people will send me pictures, and it's not always possible from the picture to put together what it is, but it's, it's something that people really enjoy learning about. Um, sometimes even the butterflies get confused. We'll see multiple species sort of piling up together, courting each other. Um, which they probably wouldn't have access to each other in their natural habitat. They get in there and they go, it's orange! Party! And we, actually, one of the most popular items in the butterfly house is the extension cord to our pressure washer. <laughs> and we'll be in there in the morning cleaning and there are butterflies just introducing themselves like crazy <laughs> because it's more orange than anything else they've ever seen. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, also learning about deceptive patterns, this, this butterfly has, I think I have to use it. too wild about blazers, but if you're a predator you might see the tip of that wing and think that it was its head and grab that instead of the, the real head and the butterfly gets away. And in fact we see a lot of them where this part is broken off and we think that people make the same mistake, they're trying to grab it and they just grab it breakaway part. The Butterfly House meets a lot of different moves <coughs> and styles and it, this this is one of my favorite pictures of just somebody just letting time go by and looking and enjoying and hopefully creating some memories. Um, so now let's take a look at some of the operations that we have. Um, the life sciences staff is the folks that I manage. And this is pictures of some of the other activities we do. That's um, Adrian is feeding animals in our tide pool, and Brianna is, I think, putting velvet ants in a desert exhibit, and Dan is collecting some um, wax myrtle to feed our stick insects. We take care of the plants and animals. We train the public contact staff. We, there aren't enough of us that were. <coughs> generally not out there doing public contact except when somebody has a question and then we'll come answer it or you know if we're in the process of doing something and you walk by of course we're going to chat with you. Um, we arrive with a net in case of butterfly escapes. We are ready for anything. Um, this was a picture we um, are trying to train staff about the importance of containing our butterflies and this is an artist's rendition. This is not an actual butterfly <laughs> outside the science center. Um, we use netting as a secondary containment inside the butterfly house. So you go in, it was unobtrusive when this picture was taken, it's bright orange now. Mm -hmm. um, this, all, all of this netting I, I bought from a company that had a black, a clear, and an orange. We started with the clear one, the clear has no UV treatment in it. So one year later it was breaking up into this awful powder and when we, when we tore it down it just got in everything. We had to vacuum up all the stuff off the plants and the, the leaves and the soil. It was a disaster. And we got this black netting, which is, it, it blocks out some of the light, and, and I'm a little bit obsessed with light, so I was disappointed, but plenty of light gets in. And then I went to order it when it started to wear out, and they don't make it in black anymore, just safety orange. What it turns out, everybody else who buys this netting uses it to cover those big trailers that carry the junked cars. 
and they put it over the, the cars to keep like windshields from or mirrors from flying out and hitting you as you drive behind them. Um, so it's safety orange for visibility and so that they can spot rips in it really, really easily. Um, I almost cried <laughs> when a box of bright orange netting arrived mm -hmm. and I thought, it, it, we're ruined, it's, it's a disaster. But what you really get is just a sort of sunset glow around the edges. Mm -hmm. Next time you're in, you can kind of notice and it looks like it, it was an idea all along. <laughs> I think. Um, we also train people using propaganda posters, um, just telling them that if butterflies actually do get out of the butterfly house, we, we view it as a very serious thing. We don't want them out laying eggs in the Seattle Center. We want you to catch them. It's okay to catch them however you have to and bring them back. And that's, I love Uncle Sam, so that's me. Yeah, Uncle Sam. Um, when we get new pupae, we get pupae from around the world, um, from El Salvador, Costa Rica, Suriname, Philippines, um, Kenya, and also from an uh, importer that gets them from a few other places, Malaysia in particular. And they're all unpacked inside this sleeve cage here. <coughs> Sometimes we'll unpack a shipment of pupae and I've had cockroaches in there, or flies coming out. And we just, we want to have a, a, a layer between what we're unpacking and then flying out and, and just flying out the door. Um, that's the exception, but what's pretty common, about 3% um, of pupae harbor some kind of parasitic wasp and, or fly. And you'll notice these are both Papilio species and it's one of the genus that we have in Washington State as well. Unfortunately, a lot of them are parasitized. So there's never, nobody's ever studied could these um, wasps jump out of that tropical species and come live in western tiger swallowtail. But we're really, really cautious with parasitoids. We don't want to take any chances with those. And um, we can usually spot them in the chrysalis before we, as soon as we handle it. A lot of times we'll shine a bright light in and we'll actually see the larvae for the wasps kind of moving around in there. Um, or occasionally you'll see adult wasps sort of massing to come out. Um, it's it's uh, interesting to see. And once in a while even we'll open a ship and, and this will happen where the fly larvae will really break down the, uh, the outer skin of the, the pupa and it'll burst. Um, so. We try, we don't want to, the last thing we want to do is go in with a vacuum into a big space and have to vacuum all of those up and up, we got them all. Um, although, the great thing about them is they are strongly attracted to light. So, in a worst case scenario, they all go to the brightest light in the room. Once we determine the pupae are healthy, we pin them on these strips here. And the pupae are packed, the, the vendors try to leave a piece of silk that the chrysalis hanging from. Whenever possible, we put it in through the silk. If we can't, we have to use hot glue. And the first couple of times we do that, we're always just sure we're killing them. But they seem to withstand the hot glue very well. And then they're hung in the, um, on, on racks in our emerging case. And that's Jesus just making sure after we pin them all up that none of them fall off again. A fall is pretty much fatal to them. So we're Double checking them all the time. Um, the fabric you see is diapers. We use reusable baby diapers and everywhere that the pupae are going to be because butterflies produce lots of meconium, the, the waste product when they emerge. Um, there's a great picture of it. Mm. And that's actually one of the wonderful points of contact that I can have with the younger audience is because. Kids will come in there and they get to a point where, yeah, mom, it's cute and they're beautiful and the flowers are nice, can we go? And they say, that one's pooping and pooping and pooping and pooping. Mom, mom, you've got to see this. And it, it's, there's different ways in for different people. And it's something that when you talk about, about pupating, it's pupating to some people. And um, particularly when you say how long they're spending in that transitional state. 
how much they eat as caterpillars, how important growth is to a caterpillar, and then how important to a butterfly flight and lightness and being airy and what has to happen. Something has to happen in between those two stages. And you know, then the kids are like, Mom, I gotta leave you. <laughs> you know, funny. So it's kind of it, it brings out sort of the inner you know, eight-year-old and even some of the grown-ups. Um, once the butterflies are ready to be released, so that guy will be ready in probably three or four hours. His wings still need to expand to dry. Um, we grip them with a forcep, and we have to immobilize all four wings and um, keep them from flapping around because they're strong enough that they can break their wings by flapping. And the butterflies are placed in a dark box. If if we use light box like um, boxes that they can see out of, they'll just fly and fly trying to get out. But when it's dark, they just become motionless. And we bring them out for release. That is Terry. He was the first intern that ever worked for us in the, in the butterfly house. He's doing a release, and that's his dad back there. Just <laughs> supportive parents are fantastic. Um, he is placing the butterflies on food that we've seen them nectaring from before. So we need to, we spend a lot of time observing their behavior so that when they're ready to go out on exhibit, there's somewhere that they can pick up again right away. Newly released butterflies need a little extra protection. Um, so we have signs just encouraging people to watch what they do with their hands, letting them fly, and also to watch their step. And this is something where some of our guests, like everybody just has different world interests, and there's some kids who are just born you know, traffic guards, and they want to protect the butterflies, and giving them control of these little um, little signboards has, has proven to be very helpful, so that instead of feeling that they have to come you know, and share what they find, they feel like they can actually protect a butterfly on their own, that's where they need to. Um, our horticulture team has their work cut out for them in the butterfly house because we've created a great growing environment, and then we keep telling them it's, it's too shady, we need more light, we need to get rid of more foliage, so we want to have very, um, Architectural plants with a lot of a lot of sense of presence that give it a, a look of, of age and, and of arriving at a stage, but we want to let in as much light from our artificial and natural lighting as possible. So they spend a lot of time reducing foliage plants and making sure that there's enough nectar in one place that it's worth the butterfly's while to go there. If we put just one plant, butterflies aren't going to bother. Uh, if there's a nice spread of the same color and the same shape of, of flower, they're going to be more attractive. We spend a lot of time disposing of waste from plants and animals. Uh, the plant waste is frozen for a minimum of 72 hours to make sure that there's no live eggs on them. We also don't provide host plant material for butterflies unless we have specific permits allowing us to raise them and then we would check the host material daily if we were doing that. Um, once it has been frozen, we're allowed to compost it and clean green. Anything that has been in contact with the pupa has to be treated in an autoclave or with um, alcohol. So we can take the empty skins of the pupa and, and preserve them in alcohol, but if we don't, they they got to get autoclave because of the possibility of them spreading viruses or, or whatnot to native species. We keep a lot of records for the USDA and for our own education here. And um, this is just starting with A and going to see what we, we write how many we were supposed to get for the year, the actual. Sometimes this, this isn't so much for, um, for our Department of Agriculture responsibilities, but knowing whether we got more or less than our vendor said we were going to helps us figure out if that vendor is doing a great job. Um, in this case, we have someone who routinely sends us more than we ask for. Um, some pupae simply never develop, or they develop, but the wings aren't um, 
capable of flight. So the, the shipments of butterflies is it's a race against time. And if you think about Costa Rica, you've got a, a country that has a lot of different zones, and you've got a very questionable road system in some places where somebody, you know, if you want butterflies from all over the country and you're shipping them all to one location for export, people are hurrying in there. They're like, here I am, I know this is going off in half an hour, but here's my pupae, you know, are they good? There's not a lot of time to inspect them. They may have had a very bumpy trip. Um, they may be a little further along in development than they were expected to be at the time, or a little, a little fresher. Um, so things, things right from the start, a lot of things can go wrong. Once the, the pupae are, are packed and sent out for shipping, there could be a hurricane between here and there. There could be a hailstorm acts of terror, all kinds of stuff have slowed it down. So the, the plane could have been found to have pests a couple of shipments ago and been sprayed. Um, pressure could be lost. So all kinds of, of problems happen with the shipments along the way. And um, we don't always know what the whole story is. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's very obvious around the holiday season, things get delayed a couple of days or the People just get forgetful. The box was left on a loading dock. Once we had our, our ship to go to Holland, America for 24 hours before it got to us. Um, so a lot of times, kind of long story short, a lot of butterflies end up emerging before they get to us. And it's a, it's a pretty sad sight. Um, it's something we do everything we can to expedite shipments getting here because they don't have anywhere for their wings to expand and to dry, and they have a pretty uh, limited opportunity to do well after that. Um, some are damaged in transit, and that's something where we can a lot of times work with the vendors on the box, the systems of boxes they make. The most common box that butterflies are shipped in is made out of an old cigarette container. Um, they, it's cut to shape and folded and bent and taped shut, and it, it just reeks of tobacco when you open it, and that doesn't seem like the best idea, so we strongly encourage, you know, could you look for other sources for cardboard? Um, that could be part of the problem. There's some shipping, some difficulties with shipping, which is the Department of Agriculture has a regulation about the kind of air holes that boxes can have in them. Um, anything with animals has to have um, air holes smaller than a certain size and with mesh over them. And then the international airlines require air holes for breathing. Well, the pupae really have enough oxygen. They, they take fairly little air so that if they're packed with a good deal of cotton, that is not, they've not suffocated. Um, but a lot of times a box will get held in customs because they open it up and it doesn't have enough air or it has too much air. Um, and it can, it can be delayed by a couple of days for that. So all of those things can be problems. Um, parasitized, I think we showed some pictures of that. So we keep track of all the, um, every pupae that, that comes through our hands. And uh, we also do sort of the summary for people. Um, so in 2010, we had 73 shipments of pupae and um, 137 species. We got a total of 25, about 26,000 total pupae, of which um, 20,000 survived to healthy adulthood. And that's about 79% of them made it, which is, given all the things that have happened in the course of a year, is good. Mm -hmm. um, given that sometimes whole boxes can be delayed. Um, it's something we're, we're pretty happy with. Um, the, the one we got the most of was the Blue Morpho, and I always keep track of who has the best emergence rates. Um, some of them do really, really well. There's some that are just bomb-proof, and no matter what happens, they seem, seem to get pretty good results. Um, others, we have to evaluate whether the impact of that species is worth having half of them never emerge at all. Occasionally it is if it's 
dotted gold chrysalis. It might be something where we teach people about the chrysalis instead of the butterfly. But a lot of times, you know, 50% loss represents a lot of, of labor on our part and the part of the person who grew that butterfly. Um, may not be worth it. And which species have the most parasitism is something that may or may not be significant to the farmers. If you have, it, it may have as much to do with who's growing them and what kind of conditions it's under. In El Salvador, they have lots of hurricanes. And you can have a farm that's doing really well, one big wind comes through, rips up all the netting, and the wasps get in. Um, and that's something they may not be able to, it may be out of their control, but it helps us to keep track of. Thank you. And I just wanted to acknowledge the many people whose pictures were in here, or who took pictures, or contributed in other ways. So, questions? Yes? Um, do you, what kind of light do you, uh, do you have special light for the gray days? When you we do. Light? Yeah, we have light even today. The, the lights were on for um, several hours during the day. We have um, full spectrum, 1,000 watt light bulbs. We've got 24 of them. And then we've got um, 16 250 watt bulbs around the perimeter that don't seem to do much good. Um, but the, the 1,000 watts do, and we're, we change them out every fall. What we've discovered is that the whole blue end of the spectrum is, is missing by now. And um, they look fine. You know, and our, our accountants come in and say, you don't need to change them because you got light. But when we take them out and put in the new ones, we're going to find green in places we never saw before. How full spectrum is your full spectrum? What, what are the limits? I don't know. Sorry. Yes. And back, all the way back. Do you have uh, graduate level research going on inside the library? We do not. Um, if anybody wants to approach me, I'm always welcome. <laughs> so um, come talk to me if you, if you have thoughts on okay, something you'd like to do. Um, it's something where we would need to work out um, what your impact would be on the public, how you would communicate what you were doing, but there's opportunities. Yes? Are you familiar with the uh, Emperor Swallowtail Butterfly of Helio? Oh, it's cephalus. Very slightly. The yeah. reason I ask, uh, I met somebody who said they had a butterfly they did an image of. They, they drew and they drew it off of a photo. I said, well, send it to me. I'll take a look at the photo. It turned out to be this species, and they found it in Vancouver. And it's an Asian species. And I they found it outside in yes. Vancouver? They found it flying free in Vancouver, British Columbia. And so, so I thought, okay, it could have come from a butterfly house. It could have come from somebody, you know, having imported a pupa uh, unintentionally, uh -huh. uh, or potentially imported any stage that somehow was able to make it to the Delta. And so, uh, you know, yeah, and the first thing you want to do is commend that person for, at some level, noticing that, hey, I've never seen that before. Yeah. And um, obviously, you go around and you see a butterfly, and you think, well, that's big and yellow, and it's bigger and different. Um, but that <laughs> wouldn't be naturally occurring. She didn't expect to identify it. I, I, I said, oh, I'll tell you what it is. And I looked up, I don't know what this is. And it's like a web search. Yeah, you have to look that up. Yeah. And we do get a handful of those every year in our butterfly house. So, I mean, the other very s slim chance, whether from our butterfly house or from the one in Vancouver, is theft. And we have confiscated butterflies that people have been trying to take. Um, it's not easy to do. You know, it's easy to take dead butterflies, and we found those in people's hats and socks. Um, but. They're, they're already not in good condition by the time the person's 
stashing them um, to, to take live butterflies and keep, you need to know a certain amount about butterflies. You know, you need to have your glassing envelopes and something to put them in. And, and it would be conspicuous. Um, but that's the other thing that we worry about in addition to escapes would be, you know, what if somebody is, is trying to do it? Um, we get a lot of questions about, well, could I build my own butterfly house? And could you guys sell me some of your butterflies? So people are, people are interested and would like to do that, and I think maybe are going through all the ramifications. Um, and we get occasional, you know, we should set them free kind of comments. So that's also possible. Um, in the states, the USDA is who you would contact if you found something like that. I'm not sure who you would communicate with in Vancouver. You, you, several people here are sure. Yes? Can I ask uh, how much I have to pay to get some of these pieces? Oh, you mean like per per, per pupa? Pupa, yeah. Um, anywhere from the ones in the Philippines tend to run around seventy to eighty cents each, up to ten or fifteen dollars for some very unusual species. Uh, over here. Yes. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how <clears throat> the vendors grow these things? You mentioned netting getting torn loose and the wasps getting in. It sounded like sort of an outdoor mm -hmm. setting. Some of it is, and some, what a lot of them will do is they'll have a netted outdoor flight area where the butterflies are ovipositing. And some of them really do much better with, with um, mating and, and ovipositing and when they're able to fly well. And then they'll take the plant material with the eggs on it and put it in a more controlled situation. Um, the ones I saw in Costa Rica, it, was, it looked like a shower stall like you get from Home Depot and had a, a glass door on it and a kind of a lip and a big plastic vase with the plant material in it and the caterpillars were just placed on the material. And it was a pretty intensive farming. There was a, a, there were a lot of frasses produced. They have pretty strict standards about disposing of the waste because there have been butterfly farms where species have Stop, stop thriving because of accumulated waste from that species or from introducing them from one part of the country to another, bringing disease with them. Um, so they're, they're, the, the caterpillars are raised in a more contained environment. Um, but a lot of it is open to the air. It's a little bit less laboratory than I was expecting. There's a lot of breezeways and walking through and um, where here we would expect to be in a corridor, it might be a, a netted side to a corridor and, and open to the air. Yes, I noticed one of your slides, um, you had butterfly species from the US, and so I'm wondering which ones you get typically, and then also how do they, are there butterfly farms here? In the US? Which slide, Let's, or which ones were they? It's at the end where you, you know which countries you okay. get butterflies from at the very end of oh, okay. the USA. I was wondering about this. Like, okay, so yeah, the, Kenya and USA. when we say USA, there's, there is a broker in Denver. Okay, the name just cracks me up every time I say it. So I'm going to say it. It's London Pupae Supply in Los Angeles, and they work out of Denver. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a sorry, small world. Um, and they're a broker for worldwide butterfly sales. Oh, okay. So he does work with people in Florida and Texas, and also with people in Malaysia, Philippines, um, Kenya. He's one of the few people that has had great success importing from um, Kenya and, and handling the paperwork, which is pretty daunting. Um, so, yeah, so, so the U.S. species we do have are from a very southern tier of states. Um, and they're actually, they're, they overlap with species that are found in Costa Rica and the South, or it's the longest mostly. Okay. 
Yes. Can you say a little about your relationship with the USDA and inspections and how much trouble it was to get permission to do this anyhow? And it was a fair amount of trouble to get started. There you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and partly because it was a bit of a moving target. We were not told exactly what we needed to build. We were told what we needed to look for, but not how to design it. And so you get this clique of people trying to design something, and one of them's an architect and they want it to look at it. It's like a joke, you know, and one of them's a, a butterfly person and wants them to be able to fly well, and somebody else wants, you know, there's got to be a ticket kiosk nearby so we can make some money, and um, you start adding all these, these needs together, and then you draw a plan, and then the USDA says, no, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so, there was a whole lot of back and forth and dialogue on what kind of glass do we use, and what how the panes need to be sealed. But by the time we were inspected, we had pretty much built to their standards. So the inspection was, you know, looking for a couple of things for us to change rather than going in there and, and say tear it down and start over. You know, they were, they were putting dollar bills in the doors and uh, we got to tighten the closers a little bit. Um, the, after the first inspection, we opened we got a second inspection and then 9 11 happened. Mm -hmm. And the USDA, the part that we worked with, came under Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot changed. And at that time, nobody knew what was, you know, there was that sense of confusion. And no one knew what was going to happen. And my anthrax come in in a box of chrysalis. And there was just a lot of anxiety and distrust. And, um, we were very fortunate that the person who coordinates Butterfly House is Wayne Welling stayed okay. with us okay. through that. Um, and, and he is very, you know, he's strict, but he's fair, I guess. So he didn't, didn't get completely... So that was one of my questions, was yeah. Wayne? Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, he's been very yeah, that's a, big a good man. contact. Yeah, yeah. and he's also... Um, for example, you know, if you don't get, if you don't do the things you're supposed to, you will get in trouble. But if you do what you, you're supposed to, you you won't. And there have been times when I've turned in permit applications and they just stall, and I have no idea why. And, you know, I want to get inspected, but there's no one to inspect us. And and um, he's pretty good at getting those things going again. And, and it's he doesn't have the sense of, well, you should have done that six weeks ago. It's wrong. Well, let's let's get your permit to you. Uh, yes. What temperature and humidity do you try to stay at? We try to, the butterflies want 90 degrees and people want 80 degrees and we try to compromise. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with humidity. I think the butterflies would like as high of humidity as we mm -hmm. can get. Especially we find that the, the species from the Philippines would like to have 90% humidity. And people just won't stay in a room <laughs> when, when you do that. Um, people, especially photographers like low humidity come in in the winter and they can't take pictures for <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> so um, we compromise and, and the temperature is, we shoot for about 84, 85. And um, the humidity is usually high in the morning. It's probably about 70% in the morning and drops over the course of the day. The other thing we found is that when we let the humidity go lower, we have less plant pests and less um, fungi and things growing in there, which is desirable. Yes? With the USDA, do they come in on surprise inspections? Are they usually scheduled? Or? They're usually scheduled, and our local inspector, um, Jim McDonald, is very, he likes inspecting the Butterfly House. And <laughs> he, um, he likes to bring people with him. <laughs> so I always feel like I'm sort of halfway, you know, I'm nervous and wanting to make a good impression, but we're also in the show and tell. So this, it's a funny um, give and take going on there. And they'll usually finish the inspection and then just be like, well, we're going to go play in the dinosaurs now. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they, again, they've been, um, when they have found things, they've been very diligent in making sure that um, we have screens on our drains and that our bottom clay 
has um, up-to-date repair records on it, and um, the, our, our T's and their I's are taken care of. So they're, they're doing their job with the inspections. And, and I'll also see them after I leave talking to other people. So I think they're making sure that everybody has the same training. Yes. How do you decide what farms to use? It sounds like you've been to Costa Rica to see some of them. Yeah. Um, the, I'm a pretty loyal person, and once I have a great working relationship, I tend to stay with that vendor. Um, we have a vendor in Costa Rica that has worked out very well for us, a vendor in El Salvador who um, is doing a lot of uh, environmental work there, and this, we don't always have quite the same vigor with the, the pupae we get from him, but the pupae he keeps behind and is, is using for the populations there are, I believe, very important. Um, so, we, and when there's a new part of the world, Suriname started having butterfly farming, and we were curious about Suriname, and it's been fascinating because we get a lot of the same species, we'll get the same species of longwing from Suriname and from El Salvador, and they, they look completely different. Um, their, their, their colors are different, and they're, you know, where they're black and where they're red. So we try to, we, sometimes we just, I don't know that one out of 10 of our guests cares or notices that, but some stuff we just do for ourselves. You know, it's, um, I like that, I think that's interesting. So that's part of it. Do you, are you dealing directly with the farms, or are the vendors more kind of aggregating? It really depends. Some of them have mm -hmm. um, either collectives or brokers within the country, and others, it's it's directly with the farmer or the farmer's sales rep. Yes. Do you distrust the brokers, or do you feel that you need to go to the countries and look for yourself? Oh yeah, I gotta go to all the countries. <laughs> 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 I would like to, and and I communicate with other people who work with <coughs> all the different places. Do you get involved in the countries and their environmental um, practices or whatever, or? Is that kind of not within the range of what you? It's do? not something that we can do as our as our main focus at this point. No, it's something that we're interested in and we're interested in sharing with our our visitors. But it's not. We're unlike a zoo. It's not something where we have a sec second group, you know, a department that's dedicated to that. Um, and the artist group. You uh, mentioned the large parasites. Do you uh, ever have epizoites from fungal bacteria? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, we have a lot of uh, fungal problems with the pupae. And usually they, they get there and it's already, we haven't had something that, that went through and wiped out all of our species. Um, but, but we'll have a box that arrives and there's just one section of it where everybody's got white. Mm -hmm. Growths coming out of their spiracles, and we dispose of that, and then just isolate the rest of them and, and clean them lightly. And it, it doesn't appear to spread from pupa to pupa that way. But yes, that's been a major threat we have. You don't see much post emergence. Yeah. Are mites a problem? I don't think for the adult butterflies they are. And the pupae have been cleaned before they come to us. Yes? Do you interact with other butterfly houses to any extent? First one I ever saw, the only other one I ever saw was outside of Denver. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a con an annual conference of invertebrates and education and conservation conference in Arizona that I go to. and. Um, that's for all, you know, we talk about our tide pool and we talk about how to raise velvet ants and all kinds of things, but butterflies are, are a pretty common theme. And then I haven't been before, but this year I'm going to uh, butterflies only conference to meet with the same people there. If uh, there are sort of tourist attractions and butterfly houses around, or do they have all the same restrictions on them that you do? The USDA is on top of them in all the same ways. So if you're going to a 
billboard advertised Butterfly House. Um, they've got a lawless and controlled. Unit. If it's in the U.S., it yeah. should have been inspected by the yeah. USDA. Every state has its own set of oh, really criteria. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure the butterfly houses are yeah. In the he hears of one that he, has he hasn't inspected it. He's, um, and to get in the country, the pupae need to be going to an inspected designation. But you're also, every state is going to have a different attitude towards how they do their inspections and whether the, the State Department of Agriculture additionally wants to get yeah. involved. If I had a citrus crop as one of my big um, agricultural concerns, I would be inspecting really differently than I would here because a lot of the butterflies we have eat citrus as a host plant. So, you know, I, and, and a couple of them have been released for, in one way or another. Um, Paleodemolius, I believe, was found in, in um, the Dominican Republic and then was blown over into Florida during a, a hurricane. So they, they, you know, we don't need to imagine these <laughs> Jurassic Park things that happens. And um, if, if one of your big agricultural products is one of the host plants of the butterfly, your, your inspection is going to be a lot more rigorous. Um, but you'll also, if you, if you visit three butterfly houses, you're going to see three different ways that they do things. If, um, you know, here in Washington, the big natural disaster we could have would be an earthquake. And if there's an earthquake, there will be no warning. And glass is going to break. And I won't be allowed back in the building probably for more than 10 minutes. So I've got some um, pesticide bombs, and I'm going to set them off, and then I'm going to go home to my family. Um, if you're in a place that has hurricanes, you're going to see it coming. You're going to call the name of the USDA and say, hey, if you look on a map, there's a hurricane coming. Do you have any recommendations? And he's going to say, you don't need to break out the pesticide bombs. Just catch all the butterflies and put them in the fridge, and you know, uh, in which which is what they did before Katrina, and they never came back to get them out of the fridge. But um, yeah, they. Um, I talked to a gentleman who worked at the the insectarium there. And, he actually came back to feed the animals, and what he did is he said, I work for the city, I'm here to take care of the bugs. And they thought he was afraid for mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, people, people in places that are in, in the path of hurricanes have different types of concerns than we do here, and different ways of being prepared. Cool. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was very informative.